Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we talked about the corticospinal tracts and saw that these are a two-neuron system of upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons that ultimately control skeletal muscles in general at the level of the neck and everything else below. So trunk, arms, hips, legs, abdomen, back, all that stuff. Now, when you hear the term bulbar, you need to think cranial nerves, and that's exactly what the corticobulbar tracts involve. They synapse with cranial nerves that go out to muscles of the head, the face, and a little bit in the neck. Okay? But they're going to follow a very similar pattern to what we saw in the corticospinal tracts. Now, before we get into all this, take a look at the brain here. And then down here is the brainstem and spinal cord. This is an anterior view. So over here is the right hemisphere of the motor cortex. If we look at where the upper motor neurons come from, what we should notice is that as we go from the head all the way down to the lower extremity, the origin of each of these upper motor neurons goes from lateral to medial and eventually down into this longitudinal fissure right here. So the most medial here are going to the ankle and foot, and as we go out laterally, we get higher and higher and higher, generally speaking, until we get out here, we're really in the head and the face. So in red here, these are the upper motor neurons of the corticobulbar tracts. And as the upper motor neurons exit the motor cortex and descend downward, you can see that those upper motor neurons are going to travel with those of the corticospinal tract, which we see here in blue. So they're going to be right next to them. Okay? And they're going to follow pretty much the same path. They're going to descend down through the thalamus, and ultimately into the brainstem. Now remember the brainstem has three components from superior to inferior, a midbrain, a pons, and a medulla oblongata. And in general, we're not gonna have to worry about the spinal cord for the corticobulbar tracts. The way to think about the corticobulbar tracts as they descend down through the brainstem is it's like a train with three separate stops. And so if you have a train with three separate stops, some of the people get off at the first stop, some get off at the second stop, and others get off at the third stop, which, with those stops being the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. So if we look at these upper motor neurons, some of them are going to get off at the midbrain. Most are not. They're going to descend downward through those cerebral peduncles, which we'll get to in a minute. But some of them are going to get off at the level of the midbrain, and they're going to synapse with these nuclei right here. These nuclei, right where my mouse is, these are the cell bodies of the cranial nerves. When we talk about the cranial nerves, we're thinking lower motor neuron. We don't normally think of it that way, but this nucleus, right where my mouse is, these are the cell bodies of those cranial nerves, which by definition are lower motor neurons. So if we're talking about cranial nerve 3, the oculomotor nerve, okay, those axons are going to come from cell bodies here in the oculomotor nucleus. So that's what it is if we're talking about cranial nerve 3. If this were part of cranial nerve 4, then this would be the trochlear nucleus, and those nerves would go and supply the superior oblique muscle, which is another extrinsic eye muscle. And if we're talking about cranial nerve 6, the abducent nerve, well, then uh, those axons are coming from this nucleus, which is the abducent or abducens nucleus. So this isn't just one nucleus. There's an oculomotor nucleus, a trochlear nucleus, an abducent nucleus, and those are the cell bodies of those cranial nerves, which then go and they innervate specific skeletal muscles that we just talked about. So those are the upper motor neurons that get off at the first stop. But for those that don't get off at that stop, they continue down with the corticospinal tracts, descending through the cerebral peduncle of the midbrain. And they continue descending, and you get to the next stop, which is in the pons. So again, does everybody get off at the second stop? No, some of them will continue down through the basis pontus, down to the medulla. But there's a couple here that are going to get off at the pons. So these upper motor neurons right here, they're going to synapse with the cell bodies of the motor trigeminal nucleus. So the motor trigeminal nucleus, this is the cell bodies of the trigeminal nerve. That is the motor parts of the trigeminal nerve. Remember, the trigeminal nerve has sensory and motor parts. And the motor parts of the trigeminal nerve, uh, that's going to be the mandibular nerve, which is going to innervate the muscles of mastication. So masseter temporalis, and the medial and lateral pterygoids. 
we look at these upper motor neurons right here, they're going to synapse with cell bodies of the facial nucleus. And the facial nucleus contains the cell bodies of the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. And again, the facial nerve is going to innervate the musculature of the face. Zygomaticus major, frontalis. So again, not all of our upper motor neurons get off at this stop. The ones that don't will continue down with the corticospinal tracts in blue, and they'll move through the basis pontus of the pons and move down into the medulla oblongata. Now, there are no upper motor neurons of the corticobulbar tracts that actually enter the pyramids or the pyramidal tracts. Okay? So these are actually going to get off at a stop in the medulla um, superior to where the corticospinal tracts enter uh, those pyramids. And in those pyramids, remember, they decussate to the other side, at least 90% of them. That was the previous video. But where these upper motor neurons get off is actually superior to those pyramids. So they don't enter the pyramids. Okay? And we have four sets of upper motor neurons here. Okay? I think you kind of get the idea. So we have upper motor neurons that are synapsing with cell bodies of the glossopharyngeal nucleus. Those are going to be cell bodies of the glossopharyngeal nerve. And then we have the same thing for the vagal nucleus, which contains the cell bodies of the vagus nerve. We have the accessory nucleus, which contains the cell bodies of the accessory nerve, or spinal accessory nerve. And the hypoglossal nucleus, which contains the cell bodies of the hypoglossal nerve. And there's a lot of important things to understand here. One of those is that these nuclei right here, whether they're in the midbrain, the pons, or the medulla oblongata, these are clusters of cell bodies whose axons make up the cranial nerves, lower motor neurons that innervate the muscles of the head and the face and some in the neck and pharynx. Okay? And so all of these nuclei contain neurons that innervate structures in the head, the face, the tongue, and the neck. And by that, we include the pharynx and the larynx. And there's two other things that are really important to understand here. And those are that the neurons to the lower half of the face have contralateral control, and neurons to the upper half of the face have bilateral control. So if we consider the zygomaticus major, let's say on the left side, okay, it is controlled solely by the right half of the brain, contralateral control. So if you had a stroke of the right half of the brain here in the motor cortex and it damaged the right upper motor neurons of the corticobulbar tract, then the left zygomaticus major is going to have paresis, as will all of the muscles on the left side in the lower half of the face, because their only source of control is that contralateral side of the brain. The left zygomaticus major muscle is going to have no control by the left half of the brain, only the right. But those neurons that go to the upper half of the face, those have bilateral control. So if we're looking at the frontalis muscle, which is above the eyebrows, right? The left frontalis muscle is controlled by not only the right half of the brain, but the left as well. And so if we have a right-sided stroke, it's not going to negatively affect the function of the left frontalis as much because the left frontalis also has some control by the left half of the brain. This is something very similar to what we saw in the corticospinal tracts when we were looking at the lateral corticospinal tracts versus the medial or anterior corticospinal tracts. One of them was contralateral control, one was bilateral. And the one that has bilateral control is always, or almost always, less affected by a stroke. Okay, so if it's the lower half of the face, there's contralateral control, and if it's the upper half of the face, it's bilateral control. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the corticobulbar tracts and how this system is set up. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.